What's up, guys? It's John Nelson, and you're listening to the Starting Block Podcast. Guys, this is a show for complete athletic development. Our objective is to give you the tools to win, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach. Now, today is Friday Fire and Fact, and it's been a minute since we've recorded one of these episodes. But as I've said in the past, I'm only going to put these episodes out when I feel like I got good content to share. I'm not just going to put some you know, bullshit out there just to, you know, put content out there. It's not how I do it. And I do feel like I got something pretty good that I want to uh, share. Something kind of popped into my head this weekend, and um, I kind of had a little bit of a light bulb moment and felt like it was something good for coaches, um, good for parents, good for athletes to hear. Now, I'm actually having to re-record this uh, because the one, that, if you follow my social, uh, Farmer John ELP, I put up a clip last night, and I was going to release it this morning, but something happened with recording and it's not working. So uh, this one may sound a little more scripted. And if it does, I apologize. I actually am doing this again. But anyways, here's the point, okay? If you're new to the show, go listen to the other shows uh, about how our show operates uh, and the breakdown. We're getting right to it today. So what I want to talk about is something that has happened at my business, ELP, throughout over the last 12 years. And it's something I'm pretty proud of, but after listening to the Dr. Jack Cruz episode and the Carrie Bennett episode, there was just this aha moment that I had this past week, and that's what I want to share with you. So we've had five different high school athletes at ELP that we have taken from some of them as low as like low to mid 80s. A couple of them started maybe in like the 89, 90 range as well. But we've taken five different high school pitchers to 95 miles an hour plus. And we, including one of them who was an official 99 in high school and unofficial 100. And we also have one female athlete who, as a sophomore in high school, was throwing harder, two miles an hour harder than the NCAA average softball player did. Now, when I step back and think about that for a second, we're in a very small market. If you don't know where ELP is, it's because we're located in Collierville, Tennessee, and most people have no idea where that is. Uh, basically, FedEx runs Memphis, and so we're right outside of FedEx, essentially. Um, we're in a really, really small market. And so to be able to say that we've taken five high school pitchers from the 80s to 95-plus and this one softball player throwing two miles an hour harder as a sophomore female in high school than the NCAA average, I feel like that's something pretty, uh, you know, something to be proud of, right? Now, there may be other coaches out there that have done better and done more, and if you have, awesome, cool. I'd love to hear from you. Leave me a comment or shoot me a message, man. I'd love to connect. But here's why I'm sharing all this. I'm sharing it all because it just clicked with me out of nowhere, and I just had this, the light bulb went off, and I said, holy shit, I get it now. And I had that light bulb moment. And that light bulb moment was the fact that I realized that all six of these athletes had the exact same qualities, male, female, it didn't matter. They all had these five elements here. And that's when I said, oh my God, this makes perfect sense. I need to share this. Okay. And so what were those things that these athletes had? And that's what I want to get to today. So number one is they all had exceptional movement patterns, minus one of them. This one who didn't have great movement patterns, I genuinely don't know where he is anymore. I, I, I hope he's doing well. But I know of all the athletes that I had that are in this group, he was the one that improved probably the least. And when I look at it, a lot of it had to do with the way that he moved, okay? So they all had great movement. They were athletes first. And I throw in this component. They also had excellent levels of GPP. They could crush sleds. They could crush sled pulls, sled pushes. But they didn't have very good maxes, except for the female. She did. None of the other ones had exceptional maxes. Well, I take that back. One guy did have a very, very good squat. So 
But in general, most of them did not have great maxes. They were very, very good movers, and they had very high levels of GPP. Now, I prefer, I'm kind of a West Side meathead guy at heart. I love sled work. I think sleds are the most undervalued tool in athletic performance in any gym. We do a lot of sleds. We go through waves because if you don't know what the you know climate here in Memphis is, it's hot as hell in the summer. Like I'm just not going to subject kids to that type of stuff when it's 118 degrees with 99% humidity out here. So like we have to ebb and flow kind of when we do them, but we will pull sleds, we'll push sleds, we wrap around the waist, we'll hold the handles between the legs, work on the hips, we'll go backwards, we'll go forwards, we'll go sides. We do a ton of sleds, okay? And all these athletes mastered it, and I thought that was a very interesting component. So they mastered the GPP, they had great movement patterns, um, and that's kind of one of the things where, and I've, I've said this before on air, that that's where the go-to stuff clicked for me, is when one of our guys went from mid 80s to 99 and 100 i saw it it made sense to me and then that's kind of when i you know went and explored you know the go to side of stuff so that was number one okay number two they could all hold extreme isometrics all of them they were dominant in them they could get to deep positions. They could recruit the right muscles. They could add max weight. They could hold max weight for 10 seconds. And if you don't understand that, max strength essentially is going to happen between zero and, se- zero and 10 seconds with about that five second being the determining factor between speed and strength dominant. That's a whole other conversation. But they could hold max weight in extreme positions. They could do yielding isometrics they could do overcoming they were dominant in the isometric component to it regardless of how you believe isis should be implemented they dominated in that all right that was something that also clicked with me during the training it was like man all of these guys and, and girl they could all do this and they could all recruit the the right musculature and that's a very important concept i think there's so much talk out there about isos extreme isometrics and all that stuff and there's a lot of people out there that talk about it they don't have any experience with it or they actually maybe copied some things that other people were doing so they don't actually really understand some of the dynamics behind it but some of the dynamics that you really need to get the fact that you got to be able to recruit the right musculature without compensating so for example on the lunge it does no good to get to the deepest position of the lunge if you're going to hyperextend your back because that's going to throw off your um, your hip extension pattern and so when you see guys getting these deep lunge with the back arch like like freaking shakira like no bro that's not how it works but so all these athletes they could do it and they could dominate at it so they were good movers with high levels of gpp and they could crush isos in all capacities the next one they all could land altitude drops and if you listen to jay when he came on our show uh probably a year ago at this point now he talked about altitude drops actually being one of the first things um, that was part of his system. And I would love for Jay to come on. And I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. But with us, the drops, all right, Dan Victor taught me a lot about altitude drops. I owe him a lot for that. But we would do exceptionally high volume of drops. I didn't follow the Verkshansky's model of, you know, whatever it is, four sets of 10 twice a week, or whatever. Hell no, we'd do like 150 a day, all right, at different heights, different positions. I'd have guys doing altitude drop push-ups and altitude drop barbell curls and, you know, altitude drop squats and lunges. And, I mean, some of these guys would actually jump off cages, right? Like, <laughs> if you scroll through ELP's Instagram, I think I've still got some of the pictures there. You'll see literally guys jumping off cages. There's a particular pitcher in here who's actually jumping over somebody i think he's jumping over me um i don't really remember it's been a long time though um but nevertheless these guys could get up okay but they could also land right they could land and that is the key all right we can only produce as much force as our body knows that we can absorb right we can only run as fast as the brain knows that it can safely decelerate itself from that's the whole point in drops life or death scenario bam teach the body how to turn on because ultimately that is what throwing is that is what sport and athletics is all about being able to turn muscles on and off it's not about how strong you are it's about how fast you can turn muscles on and off can you do it efficiently and hold position all of these athletes could they could drop and they could absorb and they could turn on and stabilize and do everything that they needed to do um and so that was a great great quality that all of them had and i think it absolutely massively contributed to their excess and then the final element and this was really the big one that hit me this week okay and this is where the you know dr jack and carrie's work come came in all of these all six of these athletes they all were engaged in well a learning and asking me questions and i'll tell you what coaches 
if if you're going through a, a, a time right now where you can't get athletes to engage and talk to you and ask you questions, brother, you're not alone. I'm dealing with the same thing right now. And if you're one of my athletes listening to this, ask questions. That's what we're here for. We're here to teach you, right? I don't care about this. This isn't about my ego. It's about teaching you and helping you get to the next level. So ask questions. So coaches, you're not alone. I deal with it. It's <laughs> deal with it every day. But the point is, is, these athletes all ask questions and were engaged. But the elements that they really implemented in their life were the basics of things they should be doing: following their macros, getting eight hours of sleep, um, you know, getting you know, getting their water in, getting minerals in, things like that, eating clean organic food. But one of the bigger ones that I noticed that light bulb aha was they all were engaged in my theory of blue light. Now, I have preached about the detrimental effects of blue light for years here at ELP, and I have taken so much shit for it over the years because I live in the South. I've taken a ton of heat for it, but the bottom line is the literature shows that it's out there. You got Dr. Cruz, you got Carrie Bennett, you got all kinds of other people doing it. You got Dr. Brandon, Dr. Brandon Wally was on our show. Dr. Brandon, great friend, great dude, great optometrist too. He's talked about it, right? Blue light is crushing our bodies, and it's crushing our athletes as well. If you listen to Carrie's episode, she talks about how blue light actually blocks the water absorption. And so we're literally dehydrating ourselves by getting under these lights. All of these athletes were engaged with that in some respect. Now, at ELP, I require our athletes to have the blue light filter on their phone. But at school, I can't control what they're doing, right? So, you know, they're in front of computers, iPads. I encourage them, try to get blue light blocking glasses, okay? Doing little things like that. That was huge, and I think that was um, massively overlooked on my part, which is why I want to share that now, because I think this is an element that coaches, if you really take seriously, and you can convince, and you can get your kids to buy into this, regardless of the level that they're at, they are going to make massive, massive strides. Whether you coach middle school, high school, college, pro guys, it doesn't matter. You will see a change if you can get them to buy into it because our world is inputting so much stress and information into an athlete's system. We literally can't handle it. They literally can't do it, and they break down. They break down. So if we can mitigate these stressors and eliminate the little things that we can and get the body back to doing what it's supposed to be doing, then we've created a major competitive advantage for that athlete. And blue light is a big, big, big part of that. Blue light was one. They were all engaged in things like, you know, grounding and, you know, some su- and sunlight. At that time, I didn't really understand the benefits of morning sunlight. But I noticed that a lot of us, actually, some of these guys that were in this group, we actually trained a lot early in the morning, um, which I just thought was interesting. I don't really know how much that played a role in it. But uh, nevertheless, we did. But, you know, they would go out and ground. They come in, and they were engaged with it. They liked it. They, they followed all this weird, crazy shit that, you know, John was known for doing. But guess what? Their careers exploded because we put the body back in a position where it was working for them and not against them. And that is something that as coaches we all have to take responsibility for. We've got to get the athlete's body working for them and not against them because this day and age, this society, the body works against them, and we have to fix that, and it's up to us to do that, I think. Um, they also ate clean, organic food for the most part. Now, you know, most of them, they're still teenagers, so I always tell our athletes, look, man, be a teenager. Still do what you do because when you get to be my age, when you're 36 or so, bro, you can't go to Buffalo Wild Wings. It just doesn't work anymore, right? Like, wife's going to have me sleep in another room for like two days. It just That's how it works now, right? And, uh, you know, you older coaches, you guys know what I'm saying. So, Telling them, hey, still be a teenager, right, and still go, you know, hang out, go do things with your buddies, whatever it is you like to do, that's fine. But throughout the week and and even in Saturday and Sunday, having those certain things that you do on a daily routine basis that are routine for you, that adds up. And so whether that's your water, whether that's, you know, eliminating, you know, the chocolate milk from your diet um, or whatever the case may be. You know, that you've worked out with your coach, you're able to actually, you know, um, enjoy yourself a little bit and live life. And so those were a couple elements that just kind of, aha, holy crap, light bulb went off. All of these athletes that accomplished exceptional, exceptional feats in their high school career, I can all backtrack and say they all had these same qualities to them. All of these athletes went on to play college, some of them very, very high level. Um, Some of them are in the pros right now, and I hope that they make it. Some of them may have made it. Some of them are making it up there, and I hope they do. Um, 
And I hope they still take you know some of the things that we talked about and we did into consideration because I do think it'll help with the longevity of their careers. And so that's what I wanted to speak on today. I keep these Friday uh, you know Fire Fact episodes short, but I thought that was of good value, coaches. I hope you can take something from this, learn it, apply it. If you got questions, if I can help you, let me know. Leave a comment, shoot me a DM. It's fine. We're here to help, guys. I, I want to help spread information and experiences that we've had. So we are a you know a vehicle for you guys. Anything we can do to help your team, help you guys succeed, help you win, help your clients your patience that's the purpose of this show guys i appreciate it if you got any value of this share the show we'll talk to you soon